Um, hi, <laughs> I'm Jill Harkavy Friedman, and I am uh, uh, honored, really, to be the Senior Vice President of Research at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. I'm a clinical psychologist, and um, I love when I think about my college essay that said, I want to be a clinical psychologist, do research and help, and clinical work and help people. And uh, it's funny because throughout my career, there's been different opinions on whether I could do both. But so far, <laughs> I'm still doing both. Um, and um, that's kind of how I got involved in suicide uh, prevention, uh, close to 40 years ago, um, when nobody would talk about it. And um, I was like, okay. And um, that's how I got into suicide prevention. And I want to start by saying that, Jeff, I am in awe of you. And I suspect I'm not the only one here. Um, I... You, yeah, I've known you for a while now, and I've known when this was a little idea, and um, and what you've developed and and grown is just incredible, and I'm grateful to be a part of it. So, thank you for your awesome self. Um, and a lot of what everybody said, I I can totally relate to, and I will as as I talk about it, um, because um, I am chronically in awe of life. Uh, you know, many times I think about how do two cells develop a person and that each cell has 32 billion base pairs of genetic material in it. Like, I don't get it. And then all the molecules have space between them. Um, this has troubled me since I learned about atoms and protons and neutrons and that there's space there and it's just a lot of things moving. I, I still can't grasp that we're a bunch of molecules moving around and somehow we are uh, basically coherent people um, and that the brain in particular is just so wild and wonderful and I um, try to use it to understand it. Um, but I think maybe my, my awe of life as I'm thinking about this is what leads me to engage in suicide prevention work. Um, I've seen people overcome or con you know connect and and fight for every breath. Um, and when I see someone who feels that the world is just too painful and they don't think they can do it anymore, I believe that they have in them that capacity to re-engage, the capacity for awe, the capacity to develop a life, as, as we say in the biz, a life worth living. And, um, and I think about, so there, I'm gonna bring in the beach here. <laughs> I am a beach person. I grew up on the water. I have I, I have drawn to the water. I um, now I'm lucky because I have, a, I live in New York City and I am a lover of awe who lives in New York City. And um, I experience all these big and tiny little events throughout the day. And I've actually been asked, I was giving somebody a lift um, home from work one day and I'm like oh, this is my favorite part and oh I love that no I haven't seen this and he just turned to me and said don't you do this every day <laughs> and I was like yeah but every day I find something new you know <laughs> um, so I love the city sorry to burst anybody's bubble about the city um, I'm not a country person but I am an ocean and beach person and I'm grateful that a couple of years ago, we were able to get a place at the beach as well that's close to New York City. And so I have, I feel just the incredible quality of life and moments in awe in both places. And I love the beach because um, from the tiny little grain of sand to the, the huge sand dunes from a drop of water or foam on the ocean to the large waves and the colors and the sounds and then the people because it always reminds me that we are, I believe, inherently motivated to be productive and to progress. And that building sandcastles on the beach is just evidence of that. That we go and we, we build these castles and you can watch people working all day together, knowing that tomorrow they will be gone. But the joy that they experience and the productivity. And so I bring that to my work work because I think when somebody isn't being productive or progressing, then they may need some 
help, some assistance to get back to that. And I, and, and you know, it, I believe that everybody has a gift and it's just about them learning what their gift is. And so that also brings me a lot of awe. Uh, and Jay, you know, fire is terrifying and I really feel for you and your experience. Uh, my friend's apartment had a fire. I've never recovered from seeing it. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but I just went in in the aftermath and it was so, you know, just so devastating to see. So I really appreciate that you've taken that experience and um, made it into something where not just you and your, your kids, but your the world can grow from it. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge what how difficult that can be. So um, working with the community of people who've been affected by suicide. So by that, I mean people who've lost someone to suicide or people who are struggling about staying alive and um, are in so much pain that they think they don't belong anymore. And they think that the world will be better off without them. And um, that brings me back to the brain <laughs> because that is their brain telling them that and, you know, people can say, I love my family and my family loves me, but they'll be better off without me. And that's that's a disconnection, which I call dysfunctional connection, D-Y-S connection. And we've been talking a lot today about connection. Um, and I think that's what happens when somebody is in so much pain, they feel that their connections are there. Like people think they're not connected at all, but I, I beg to differ. They're very much connected, but they actually think people will be better off without them. And that's a dysfunctional, I can get into all of that, but I'm not going to. Um, but working with the people who've been affected by suicide and experiencing people's deep grief and resilience that often, you know, the people I see often have are experiencing what we call post-traumatic growth that they've taken you know, the deepest pain that they can experience and they're using it to make the world a better place or what we say in um, Hebrew is tikkun olam, that, that's our mission to make the world a better place. And uh, these people are amazing. I am in awe of them. I'm, in January, we have our uh, chapter leadership conference where we have, 74 chapters right now and the leaders come to learn. I mean, <laughs> there's not a moment of downtime and um, bring this work back to their communities to for our mission, which is to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. And, you know, it's, it's a tearful and joyful event. All our walks is living with that profound grief and the healing that occurs so that, and, and um, Janae, I think that's where the narrative changes and the narrative becomes one of this happens, but it's, it, it's not defining me. And I think that's how resilience is there that you can create. Your narrative is not going away. You lost somebody, you've had trauma. The goal of, at least as a therapist, our work is not to remove that because you can't. But our work is to help people heal so that their narrative can continue to grow and be created. And it's not just determined by what happened to them. So I, I you know, the work that you do with, with trauma and you, we're not changing what happened, but we're changing the narrative so that we can have room for awe, room for joy, room for other sadness, in fact, you know, but for all of life. And the people that I meet in, um, in my work are just amazing. And I have to say the field has changed so much. I got into it because the chairman of my department, my first job out of graduate school, wanted to look at uh, suicidal behavior among teens and wanted to have a clinic. And for three years, nobody would go near it. And I, that's why I got in, oh, I'll do that, is <laughs> literally how I got in it, not knowing what a passion it would become. And I'm so grateful for that. So um, how has awe impacted my work? Um, 
I try to find, I, I think I'm pretty successful at finding awe in every person. And um, I, I love people and I, I think everybody has a gift and um, helping them to develop that sense of awe and, and sturdiness and joie de vivre. You know, uh, I have a little granddaughter now and I taught her how, when something happens to say, oh, well, say la vie. <laughs> and it's very cute. Oh, well, say la vie. But I feel that, you know, things, things happen. And if we understand that we can keep going, that we can experience those things and not be undone permanently by them. We might be temporarily undone by them, but not permanently. So um, the, um, the whole focus on awe has really heightened my awareness and it, it helps me to take note, although like I said, I'm frequently, um, and to take time and to pace my work and to be thoughtful about it and not not mind rush, um, but just take my time. So overall, I really like the awe project. I am not a visualizer. I love the pictures, but what, when I could connect to them in a visceral way, because honestly, I don't remember any of them. Um, I have no visualization ability. It's gone. But um, I, I thought of places that I was at and then with words and visceral experience, tried to experience the visualization. So, and, and I, I love them. And so just quickly, um, uh, quick, the word vast has come up now repeatedly and funny, it was in my, <laughs> my on moment was in Alaska. Uh, I've gone to Alaska twice now to work with our Alaskan chapter and I am in total awe of them. They, they just, do amazing work. Okay. I was there for 10 days. I gave 16 talks and six media interviews. <laughs> so they definitely work really hard. Um, but going to the native village and seeing the depth of depletion mixed with hope um, is something I will always uh, cherish. So I picked the um, homecoming, I'm coming home video because it terrified me. <laughs> uh, the first time I watched it, I couldn't really watch it. Um, you know, heights and, you know, those things really terrify me. So um, I decided to watch it a few times. It was really challenging for me to watch it. Um, but um, I'm glad I rewatched it again because um, being in space and seeing the earth and like you said, Jen, how tiny the earth is, um, but yet so vital to us. And that balance between individual strength and motivation and chutzpah to keep, I mean, that guy is, is just like free falling in space. I don't, I could never, you know, even imagine that. And, um, you know, he's, totally alone but he's connected to hundreds of people and they're connected to him and um he's in control then he's out of control then he's in control and um every feeling i love that the um ast astronaut and the staff and the family all felt terror and joy at some point and um it was uh, it just the whole connection of everything is i'm you can tell i'm into connection but I also, you know, I, I was graced with the family who, and I'm going to end on this, said, know when it's good and celebrate it. And I'm a firm believer in that. So I'm done. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Jill, for sharing all that and the work that you continue to do. And I think there's a lot of metaphors, even with the video that you reflected on with the work that you do. And sometimes... The one thing I would say, and Carrie, please jump in, is um, my connection. And often when I do the OA project in person with groups, people will say, well, why did he do that, right? Why would he do something like that? And then I always turn it back. And I'm not asking you for the answer, it, Jill, but I'm asking everybody, answer it in your own head. Why do you do what you do? Why are you doing it? And how easy, that's crazy. Why would you do something like that? And that's where the resilience comes in, because I can, because I choose to. And then realizing the ripple effects that you caused to help others. So thank you, Jill, for that. Carrie, what do you have? So 
Uh, one of the things I think is common thread to all of us and in thinking um, about the last comments, like how do we stoke awe in people? Uh, moving on the fire reference, right? Because there's uh, a lot going on there, but how do we stoke awe in people? People that are stuck, people that have a narrative that is um, not in sync with who they really are, or, you know, they're stuck kind of in a place. Um, so I just think that, you know, um, trying to think of the ways we stoke off in people and how do we help them make room for it. And um, my favorite, you know, so many comments, uh, my brain is wild and wonderful. And when Jeff and I try to have a conversation, it's never linear in any way. So um, mm -hmm. I really appreciate um, that piece of it. But one of the things to think about is how do we pace our work? You know, how do we keep ourselves grounded? How do we keep ourselves resilient? When a lot of us, I think, have those wild and wonderful brains uh, <laughs> that go on. Um, I would share that um, I had also written down energy is never created or destroyed and how we uh, sprinkle death, uh, dust. And uh, I guess uh, I'll just share that uh, when people in our family have passed away, we're not a particularly religious family. Um but I was trying to explain to my kids and I would say, you know, energy is never created or destroyed. Like we go back out to the universe and how that can touch us. So I was pleased uh, to hear uh, those kind of sentiments uh, today because I hope that's what we're all doing is sprinkling our cosmic dust and energy uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, so uh, that's one of my takeaways. I will say that, um, the thing that I want to say was my awe moment is when I've actually had my own kids say to me, oh, mom, look at that sunrise. Or uh, my daughter was like, look how, because I'm sending pictures to Jeff too. I know we all must bombard him with like random videos or uh, snapshots from our phone. I'm like, oh, don't crash the car to share the awe, right? But, you know, I may, I may be sending, you know, pictures of uh, different things. Uh, but when I notice my kids are taking time and moments to appreciate um, awe as well, really is um, humbling to me. And I, I will say my last piece is just on perspective shift. Um, we all get, uh, I, I develop training for, de develop and deliver training to law enforcement, um, all different allied or affiliated professionals, corrections, parole, probation, all kinds of first responders, dispatchers. And I see a lot of people that are stuck in the the survival mode and helping them try to get out of that. So those perspective shifts are really important. And on the break, I went to my colleague and said, I don't know if I'm really qualified to be on this panel. Um, I have not written any books. <laughs> I have a PhD. I am doing some very humble work of scheduling trainings. And he said, well, you've written curriculum and you've helped, you know, get people trained in trying to be more curious and compassionate toward people who are suffering an emotional crisis. And I was like, all right, fine. <laughs> so um, I just, I feel very humbled to be in this group. And I, um, again, just want to keep in mind those kind of themes of awe is portable, uh, changing our perspective can be really important, and just to be chronically in awe of life. So that's what I got, Jeff Thompson. Awesome, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you.